And I know I always say that I'm excited when I start these videos, but I am really excited, like extra, extra excited to have this next gentleman on. You have no idea who I have on here right now as a guest. His name is Ivan Budimir, and he's an expert in search engine optimization. And I had the pleasure of seeing Ivan speak at a digital marketer uh, conference. It's it's a well-respected and highly prestigious uh, marketing seminar that's held annually by uh, uh, several gurus in the in the field of digital marketing and marketing. And so it's we're really talking about the cream of the crop here that you're about to see that's going to speak in the next hour or so. And I'm so privileged and thankful to have this guy on here. It really took me, I had to beg him for, for several months now and just plead. And he's really been quite helpful, and, and, and I really appreciate that. I can't say enough thanks um, to this next gentleman here. I don't know how I'm ever going to repay him for coming on here. But um, his name is Ivan, and he is really on the cutting edge of technology. He's got his finger on the pulse of Google, and he's got an incredible working knowledge of the mechanics and the logistics of uh, of how a person can start to implement strategies to improve their search engine rankings. And that's really what you want. Think about it. If anyone goes out there and they want something nowadays, they're going to go to Google and they're going to type and they're going to search for whatever it is they need. And, and he is got his finger on the pulse of that. So many different ways. It's incredible. So, uh, Without any further ado, uh, I'm not going to steal any more of his thunder, and I think I'm just going to turn the turn the stage over to him right now and, and wish him a really warm welcome uh, for coming on here today. And uh, I'm really uh, excited. I'm, I'm like salivating, salivating, waiting to hear what he's about to say. Ivan, um, I hope that that was the best. I hope that works for you as far as rolling out the red carpet. Um, oh, oh, oh shit! I'm. Oh, oops. Am I not supposed to uh, drop the s bombs and that sort of stuff? No, no. Please, whatever makes you happy. All um, right. You can. You, you, can... You, you just built me up so much. I'm really glad that I combed my hair. Um. Yeah. <laughs> it's just uh. uh it's like, well, okay. That that's me. Cool. Well, th thank you. I appreciate that, brother. I mean, happy to help anytime. Uh, um. Let's uh. Let's let's get the show on the road. You know, you experts, you're all so humble. I love it. It's, I had another guy on here this morning, and he said the same thing. He's like, oh, well, I'm not really an expert. I was like, I was like, no, no, you really are an expert. You are. Trust me. I was like, you, you guys. It's so, so, and this is why, you know, I, I reach out to you and I say, hey, I want you to come on here and teach my audience. I want you to teach them about SEO. And, you know, you're so gracious, and, and I know that you have a, a very uh, busy operation yourself. You've got a lot of clients that you work with. Your time is very valuable. So with that being said, I'll stop rambling here. Clearly, you see my passion coming out. So um, again, just thank you. Tell us about yourself, Ivan. How did you become you know, uh, an expert in search engine optimization? You speak at these really you know, nationwide events, and these people, they have you up on stage every year. Um, How did you become a guru in all of this? Well, um you know what? I hate to talk about myself, but knowing your audience, mostly folks that are in real estate, this is actually kind of relevant because they might want to go ahead and follow the same path because once you're actually perceived as an expert, people tend to want to work with you a lot more. Um, I have actually gotten into this as this was deliberate. Like I did not one day wake up and uh, stumble upon something and it kind of led from one thing to another. Um, um, I specifically wanted to become known as the expert in a specific niche. and. Um, I'll tell you why. Um, I uh, started out my very first business a number of years ago was in digital imaging, and uh, it was hemorrhaging money left, right, and center. It was really, really bad. And uh, the reason for that is because I did not know anything about marketing. I used to be a carpenter before that. I had a job, and so one day I just, you know, I was like, "This is, this is it. Gotta quit this job. Couldn't do it anymore. My back was really back. In fact, that's why I'm kind of in a far reclined position." Of that I'm sitting in the can. But um, I decided I was going to get into digital imaging business because that's pretty much the only other skill that I had. I was good at Photoshop, and it tanked. It, it was just it was pretty Donkey Kong, actually. <laughs> so I um, lost a lot of money in it. And then uh, through that business, the failing business, I met another dude who was in multi-level marketing on the side. So he had his own business, uh, but he got into multi-level marketing. And I know people are going, boo, you know, hold it down. I'm not in MLM anymore, but uh, I had to go through those learning steps, and that's really what got me 
to discover internet marketing because um, you know you're given your uplink gives you this big list of uh, things that you got to do. You got to basically make a list of people to phone and uh, you know try to drag them onto a presentation. And once they're at the presentation, then you kind of got to go rah 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 and clap and build the excitement and all that sort of stuff. Just a lot of really bad instructions. Uh, and I didn't. They didn't know any better, so I'm, I can't blame them. But uh, you know, it's not really how you build a business today, and not in 21st centuries, if you're multi-level marketing. So I heard about this one dude online who uh, I'll give him props, Mike Dillard, who uh, had this uh, formula that says, no, 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 you're doing this all wrong. You want to have people ask to become part of your downline, not the other way around. And uh, he had a system for how he did it, and he's like, it's pretty simple. Each other multi-level marketer is something that you know really well, or if you don't know anything, then buy some courses and learn some skills. Teach them for free. Be branded as an expert. So when you invite them to a presentation webinar where you show them some really cool skills, they're going to naturally want to work with you because their upline is telling them to make a list of 20 people and phone them all up. You instead, you're saying, no, create a lead generation uh, magnet on online and attract leads to your to your system. You can teach them how to generate endless leads because hey, if you no longer have to worry about finding leads, you never have to go from that point of being needy or any of that sort of stuff because you can always just say, no, you're not good for my team type of a deal. So I, I actually applied his techniques and uh, started generating leads and starting closing people into my business and then the company tanked, of, of course. Uh, it was one of those things that just blew up all over the internet. There was like a pyramid scheme. Turned out it, it wasn't in the end, but uh, by the time the the company had gone through all of the um, um, uh, litigation and they their their name was cleared, really the only things that you can find on the internet when you type in the MLM, if the company had any legal issues, is scam this, scam that. And for somebody building the business online, there was just no way for me to go ahead and recruit any more people because people would just type it in and see what, what what's happening people were bailing so I uh, uh, I decided when I was uh, still going with this whole MLM thing that the best way to go about it is to really brand yourself in a specific niche and I thought there's a lot of people that have this broke mindset in uh, multi-level marketing and they really don't want to invest into their business anymore that they already have invested especially if they've spent out like 1200 bucks 1500 bucks to join a, an MLM company and they have to buy product that they're going to move. So there's all these extra expenses. So I thought, well, let's really focus on free traffic. And SEO was the only way. So at that time, anyways, and uh, social media wasn't all that big and whatnot. So I figured, you know what? I'm going to learn about SEO. So I just started buying every single course I could get my hands on. And um, I got, it was a lot easier back then, too. You could rank a website with pretty much. Um, you know, a <laughs> couple of keywords that you jam on a page, you optimize the images just right, a little bit of on-page on SEO and throw a bunch of spammy links at it and things would rank. But it was easy and uh, it was showing immediate results, so I started doing that. And then I showed it to a number of people that um, I used to know from my very first business. So like, hey, do you know that you can uh, you can do this sort of stuff online? Um, and uh, they were like, wow, that, that that's pretty cool. How would you do that? I you know, I need clients, people coming through my door. You know, how do you how do you rank these things? I ranked my my wife's website. She's got a Halloween store here where I live. And uh, before I know you knew it, I just had a whole bunch of people. They were asking me to do this for them, and I it kind of smacked me in the face. So like, well, I actually have a business, and given the fact that I've not learned enough about SEO, enough to teach other people, I just started teaching it because it was just so much easier to get clients by introducing them to training material first and then selling them on a back end than just outright selling the services. Here I am today. <laughs> Great story. I uh, love it. All right, so what's new in the world of search engine optimization? Because I've tried to follow it over the past few years. I know a variety of updates have come out, and Google is a very mysterious animal to try to follow because they change uh, somebody just told me recently that they did away with Google authorship. I didn't even know that. I was in the process of, you know, doing that thing where you put someone someone searches for you. It's got your little picture on there, and then just when I get up and running, Google pulls the rug out from underneath my feet, and then I'm kind of back at square one again. So 
you know, the panda yeah. update and the hummingbird and the all those different updates. What's the current state of affairs right now with uh, search engine optimization? Well, first of all, SEO is not a business model. It's a it's a traffic generation model, um, and that's hugely important for people to understand because as long as your entire business and your entire traffic strategy is revolving around SEO, you're always going to have these big, huge roller coaster rides where you get a lot of traffic, things are working really well, and then bang, it tanks because Google changed the rules. Uh, the, the, the problem is that Google is constantly measuring what people are doing on their properties, and they got a lot of properties. I mean, they got Chrome, uh, they got Android as a platform. In fact, they were able to inject themselves into every single browser out there. Not sure about uh, um, uh, Safari yet. It may very well be in there, but uh, they actually have a way to see exactly what it is that you're doing on your browser when you're browsing the internet. So they, they basically wanted to have their feelers across the entire web so it can measure how people are behaving and then they take these key performance indicators as ranking signals, turn them into ranking signals essentially. So as things are constantly changing and as Google is getting their tentacles into more and more properties they're finding more stuff that they can use in order to force us SEOs into really doing things the way they want us to, rather than actually just trying out there and manipulate the ranking signal, so to speak. Including including YouTube as well, right? Everything, anything, yeah. yeah. So the landscape is constantly changing, but at the same time, um, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of known for black hat stuff. I like to take shortcuts because I like things to rank sooner rather than later. It's a crazy concept. But uh, I uh, decided that you know what it's just there is no lo there's no longevity in it and the roller coaster is really tiresome it just kind of wears down on you so um, lately I've been kind of focusing on more and more white hat ways of how to do stuff in fact the only reason and we kind of mentioned this before we started the call today uh, the only reason why I still dabble in black hat is because you don't tell people it's black hat but you tell them hey I found this really cool loophole. It's probably not going to work six months down the road, but right now we need to exploit it, and this is how it how it works. And people go, "Wow, that's really sexy." And then yeah, they I start mean, listening. I don't, mean to inter I don't mean to interrupt, but can you just clarify the difference between black hat and white hat, just for the people watching? Uh, sure. Uh, so black hat would would be considered anything that you in, in SEO. Uh, black hat would be considered anything that you do to help rank your website, which would be considered against Google's best practices uh, guidelines. They don't have the, their terms of service. Google will never tell, you, never, never tell you this is allowed, this is not allowed. But they do have uh, best practices uh, guidelines. And every once in a while, they'll deem something as black hat because they say, well, this is, this is clearly done only to manipulate the ranking signal. There is no end benefit to there's no benefit to the end user and so we're not going to consider that a positive ranking signal in fact we're going to see what the footprint of that is and we're going to consider that to be black hat so anything that is not black hat would be considered white hat and then there's the gray hat stuff which is in between sort of like well yeah you manipulate these signals there is no real benefit to the end user but you're so good at hiding your 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 tracks that Google will likely never find out what you do. And this is kind of the area where I like to specialize in. So some people say, well, that's black hat, because clearly there is no benefit to the end user. It's only benefiting your ranking. Yeah, but if Google doesn't figure it out, then, you know, as far as Google is concerned, it's white hat, and you're, you're in the clear. So I have completely forgotten what the original question was, but um, there's oh, a little you, bit of you, wisdom. You were, speak, you were speaking about how you're kind of leaning more towards white hat, and then I and then I cut you off because I just yeah. wanted you to clarify. So um, uh, you know, it's just it's there's no longevity in it in, in black hat, and while it's really cool and sexy to find out cool, you know, black hat is is it's a it's a great strategy for me to show off a little bit to my clients and say check this out this is really really neat and they go wow that's like super smart you know you the man right that's how you build yourself up with your clients and you know I kid you not because I mean if, if, if you guys are gonna be doing that uh, with your business you wanna brand yourself as an expert try to find a way I, I always equate that to you know I wanna be the best one at picking the lock I'm not necessarily going out there gonna go out there and you know break into people's apartments but if I can use social engineering to achieve specific results 
um, or, or sell certain loopholes to attract interest. I'm going to do that because it brands me as an expert and as a result I get a lot more clients. Awesome. All right, so let's just say that you're a small business owner. Uh, or we'll take, for example, a real estate agent. So mm -hmm. you're, a, you're a brand new real estate agent and uh, you've just been given a website. Congratulations, you got a license. Now go out and find some people that want to buy or sell a home. Um, how would you implement um, this? your knowledge that you're just kind of speaking about right now, th these white hat techniques? Um, the, the tools that you have in your toolbox, what would you do for yourself you know, to try to uh, make this new website that you've just been given that you may or may not even be search engine, frankly, you, uh, you don't even uh, are friendly. Um, you, know, you know that you have to optimize it and do something with it. Uh, well, what, I wouldn't. What, what would you do? I, I wouldn't actually uh, jump and optimize a website of your own to begin with. It's a, it's a poor strategy to go because um, the way Google functions is they'll look at credibility outside in the internet. So they'll look at is this dude or this website who own you know this dude who owns the website or is this website are they already credible in the real world? Are people really talking about it? And there's ways, there's indicators on the internet. We can talk about those some specific ones that Google can measure online whether that's happening offline. And uh, if you're not, if you just built that website for the sake of web website and it's a it's just the island in the sea of nothingness where nobody really knows who you are. You're, it's just not going to rank, or, or you may be able to pull off a couple of black hat tricks and make it rank for a while, but it's going to drop out very quickly. So a much better strategy in that specific scenario would be to leverage something else that already has huge amount of popularity with with uh, your market, whoever is going to be out looking for to, to buy houses and that sort of stuff, and then rent properties like that. Now, the the thing that comes to mind immediately for most people is. Well, that means that I basically have to go to the big real estate uh, uh, websites and advertise over there, which is what everybody else does, so how I'm going to stand stand apart. And I would say, yes, you probably have to do that, but uh, that's, that's a side plan. That's what you do anyways. What you probably want to do instead is leverage uh, sites like YouTube, like what you're doing, with Hangouts. Uh, and there's a ton of different websites out there where there's they're content-driven that would be interested, interesting to your market without necessarily talking about specific real estate. Because as long as you're talking to the right person, it doesn't matter whether the message is about real estate or not, the first step is always just getting interest. And branding yourself as the authority so that when you do mention your website, there's enough buzz happening. And when you actually start generating links, either white hat or black hat way, your site starts to go up and Google says, yeah, people like this dude or gal. and he or she definitely knows what, what they're talking about. They're, they're already popular in the real world. I'm going to grant the, uh, the rankings to them. And the reason why I want to do this is because if you were to focus on what's wor working right now to rank your website, by the time you're done, things will have probably changed enough for you to have to then adjust your strategy. And you're constantly chasing that very so elusive first spot on Google. Um, so some of the things that I would do is start a podcast. Podcast is much easier to go ahead and get started. And if you're, let's say that you're in real estate and you're doing uh, real estate investments, or maybe you're somebody who uh, wants to sell houses to to people that that flip houses on a regular basis, those are repeat cost customers. They're going to have their interests that are centered around real estate, yes, but also about additional things in business, like how do you generate leads. You know, what are the best materials to use for X, Y, Z when you're flipping a house, right? Uh, how, how to best boost the value of your property. And they, believe it or not, especially real estate agents, will spend time on, um, on podcasts because they're typically busy, they're driving in their car, they're stuck in the traffic a lot. What better way to get to somebody by providing good, useful content, talk to them about that, when they're in their car. They're listening to your voice and they're absorbing the information. These are people that are information consumers, big time. And what your goal should be is identi identify whether your average information consumer is going to be sitting in front of the computer, in which case YouTube is probably really uh, really good, or if they're going to be sitting in their car stuck in the traffic, in which case podcasts are a very good way to go. And then from that point on is really it's developing that strategy of now that I have a lot of ears to you know people that are following me, 
how am I going to co convert that into sales? And that comes into creating some sort of a, a lead magnet, something that you can go ahead and say, all right, so those of you guys that are interested in XYZ, we have uh, a download on this, on this page or we have whatever it is that you, that you want to give them. With podcasts, it's a little tougher because when you're giving people URLs, oftentimes they're not in front of their computer to hear it. Um, but you, you, so you have to build the intrigue a little bit. Um, another thing that I would do, so if, here's another specific strategy. So if you have your own website, make that website the location where the podcast is. So you have a website and uh, um, you have a podcast that's submitted to, through iTunes and a whole bunch of other podcast aggregators. People are subscribing to it. And uh, in each and every one of them, you refer to your own website because that's really where the podcast normally sits. It's just be basically being fed using RSS to... Um, um, to podcast websites like iTunes, but you basically tell them, hey, you know, if you like this sort of stuff, we have the after show that you guys might want to go ahead and watch, and it's in the secure uh, area that's membership only, but it's free. So now people are giving you their e real email addresses because no one's going to give you a fake email address for the membership. Some people will, but most people won't. And uh, you can capture that through the membership on your website. And then, again, as long as you're leading with good quality content, People keep coming back, and you're branding yourself as an expert. All right, so um, I guess it's more of like a, uh, it, a roundabout, indirect type of way to get over time in the good graces of Google. Like you said, you first, uh, if you're the guy off the street and nobody knows you, you have no authority, no credibility, you've never sold a house, that's step one is just start creating content that's valuable for people to your your customer, your client, your target audience, and disseminate it in these big channels, like you said, iTunes. Uh, and then people start consuming it, and then, like you said, they're listening to it in their cars. And then you you take that and, you know, just it drives people back to the website. And then um, now you, you, going back to the that conversation. sounds like a lot of work, by the way, but i got to tell you, it's not actually. It, right. it, it really isn't. Um, podcasts can be done very quickly. I mean, you could spend about an hour, hour and a half max per unit of content a week. Mm -hmm. it's, that's really not a whole lot of uh, time. And and the rest of it is, I mean, you just kind of spend some time, go wah, 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 right? You record that, you shoot it off to whoever's going to edit that for you on Odesk for, oh, old $10 or whatever. And uh, and now you have your, your file. They can even submit it to your website for you. And if you have it properly set up on your website, the rest of the stuff is going to happen automatically. Uh, what I would do, though, is I would... So here's, here's a great strategy. Um, find people that are really big in your industry, in your niche, speakers, uh, authors, podcasters, bloggers, any of that sort of stuff. Make a list of the really high-end people. Um, have a Facebook account that's probably a good good thing or a LinkedIn and connect with those people. But bottom line is what you do is you uh, follow what they're doing, find out what their flavor is, how, how is it that they communicate their message to their clients and then use that same language that they're using to communicate to their clients and communicate to them. You're basically achieving, um, you're hitting them where they understand where they're at. Basically you're, you're talking their language. And uh, say something along the lines of, uh, hey, you know what, I, I love what you're doing. I'd love to do an interview with you, uh, if you would be open to that. And uh, a lot of people are going to say yes. I would start out with not the top gurus because some of those folks are going to be very busy and they might want they might want to find out where is this is going to be going. So they're going to ask you things like, so where is this going? What's your podcast? Well, if you have no listeners, if you're just starting out, you might want to start with a smaller fish. But get some get some content under you. And you can do that in, in the span of like four weeks. You can have like four nice little podcasts that you have submitted on your own website and that basically gets streamed out to the, uh, uh, to the iTunes. And then what you do um, is you just keep on adding content. So you hit them up. You say, hey, I'd like to... You have a set of questions that you would ask each and every person every single time. So, you, you know, how did you get started? Uh, what's the secret of success? If they, whatever they answer with those two, uh, you're going to find some nut, nice golden nuggets to go ahead and say, okay, tell me exactly what the recipe for achieving that specific thing is. And it's just a normal conversation, right? Once you're done recording that, 
it's off to somebody on Odesk. It really doesn't have to be that much time spent. But the most important part is what you do after. And as soon as it's live on iTunes, as soon as it's live on your website, send them the link and just say, hey, it's live. Um, here's the link if you, know, you want to go ahead and listen to it. And I always tell my guys, you know what, I'm going to make you sound better. Um, you know, if, if don't worry about going the, uh, the ums and the ahs, and you know, we're going to take care of that. I have this kick-ass editor who can make you sound like a nine-year-old Hindu girl, if, you know, if need be. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's awesome, and they're feeling nice and relaxed, and they do the interview. So bottom line is you're making them look good in the eyes of their audience. And you send them the link once you hit them up on Facebook or, or uh, uh, LinkedIn and just say, hey, here's the link of the interview. What are they going to do? Of course, they're going to either retweet it or re-Facebook it or, or share it amongst their circles. But bottom line is they have a following. And that following now finds out that, hey, you know, they're going to want to hear what the message was. They're going to want to sound um, intelligent when they're being interviewed and before you know it you're tapping into their audience and that's already generating buzz before you ever have to worry about how your website's ranking because people are not coming to your website on a regular basis and Google's tracking that through their browsers Google can see that and says wow this this is a popular website they have a podcast it's a popular podcast look how many people signed up and so it becomes a lot easier for you to rank and uh, the best part about it is when you do stuff like that you don't have to worry about ranking your website for the real estate keywords. You rank them for the names of the people that are your guests. Why? Because they are out there and doing marketing on their own. It's, a, first of all, a lot easier to rank your website for somebody else's name if you have a podcast on them, especially if they're not the top-level guru. I mean, if you're going to interview Tony Robbins, good luck ranking your website for that term. But if you're, if you're dealing with some middle-of-the-line gurus, people that still speak on, on stage and whatnot, their names are going to come up as keywords. And you can rank your website super easy, and we can talk about some specific strategies for how to do that. But bottom line is people are looking at those people's name, and they're finding your interview, and they're clicking on it. It's like, yeah, oh, I want to hear that dude. And what they're hearing is you, your brand, really. They hear about that dude, but through that, they find your brand, and you're getting more traffic this way. So it's a stepping stone of, of going for things that are easy first and then brand new to things that are more difficult later on. I'm speechless right now, Ivan. <laughs> uh, I kind of knew that something like this was going to come, something very valuable and, and something that our audience probably and myself did not expect. You know, uh, And I'm so glad that those days of like you know using the, the, the keyword planner tool you know, where you go in and be like, uh, oh, what are people searching for? And then you try to rank those keywords. I'm, I'm so glad that you know that you present a refreshing new uh, white hat type strategy, if you will. That uh, it, it, it's it's a beautiful thing. Everything that you just mentioned. Again, I'm speechless. But um, yeah, awesome. if you want to, we can get into some really specific items for what people can do to help their websites rank. Uh, but I would say first, focus on good quality content, and then you can do stuff like this. So I don't know if you're open for stuff like that. I am very open for it. Right. Um, yeah, definitely. All right. So um, one of the key indicators to Google as to whether the website is popular or not is whether that website is being searched for by its brand name or by its URL. That is to say that if I had bluewidgets.com and uh, I had done enough marketing outside the internet itself, so staying offline, just going out into the real world, and had spoken to enough people about bluewidgets.com, shook enough hands, kissed enough babies, people are going to naturally going to start talking about the bluewidgets.com. And an indication of whether that's happening or not is when people go to Google and they type in bluewidgets.com or just blue widgets because that's the name of the brand. So now Google is starting to measure that, how many people are typing that and when it sees that they do, they're called navigational searches, when, they, when it sees that they do, um, it immediately allows a lot of the otherwise black hat techniques to be seen as white hat. So if you're building links to your own website, uh, if you're um, you know, doing, um, well really these days it's pretty much about two things, it's backlinks and navigational searches, but if you're building links to your own website and you're building a lot of them, 
you have something to worry about unless unless there's enough people looking for your website. In fact, we've found out that this is stuff that can if you if you get your website penalized because you were doing black hat stuff, this can help your website get out of the penalty. Will it will remove the penalty in, in in a lot of cases, not every single case. But in a lot of cases, having these navigational searches will uh, will do that. So then the big trick is well, how do you force people to search for your website? And there's a couple of different ways, uh, depending on what it is that you're trying to achieve. So let's say that you're trying to rank website globally. In that specific scenario, what you're going to have to do is some form of... Well, there's, there's here's, let's talk about the white hat way first. So a white hat way would be you build your brand to the point where you're creating press releases with good quality content. Um, you have your podcasts uh, with good quality content and that, that on its own will naturally cause people to search for your website because they're hearing about it and you know rather than type in the, the specific URL most people just go to Google and type in the name of the website because Google can figure out exactly which one it is and all of those searches where people are doing the stuff in, including the ones with spelling mistakes are positive ranking signal because hey this is very organic that's how people do search for, for other websites then we have uh, um, then we have crowdsourcing. Now, that would be considered black hat, especially if you're leaving a footprint. So there's websites out there that will allow you to jump in there and give people tasks to go ahead and search for your website and then show proof that they've they've done that. And uh, given the fact this is going to be on Google, I'm not going to get into the too much of the nitty gritty because if I did, then that would cease to be effective for everybody. So it really those of you guys that are listening to this, and if I were to give you a specific formula right now for how to do this black hat, it wouldn't do you any good because if you're hearing it, so is Google and out, out the window it goes. But there's websites out there where you can buy this kind of stuff and you can cause people to do these searches across the board. And as long as they're globally located, you know, uh, then your site is going to be ranking globally. Then there's the local tricks. Now, the, with the local stuff, you want to be getting people within a specific geographic location to be searching for your website. And um, you can do that by participating. Let's talk white hat first. You can do that by participating in local discussion forums. You can use a, a really cool little trick, which is called geocaching. Um, let's talk about that. This is actually really ninja. So geocaching is you're not going to get a lot of traffic this way, but you're going to get some localized uh, searches, especially for mobile devices, which is very very useful. Yes. So ge geocaching. Uh, what geocaching is? It's a game that people play in the real world. And uh, uh, it consists of folks like me, geeks like me, going out there with their GPS units or their mobile phones because mobile phones have GPS units in them and search for these caches which are basically little containers with worthless trinkets uh, hidden someplace in the real world. So you go to geocaching.com for example, that's the main site for where that happens and uh, you look up the coordinates of a geocache and you download it into your GPS and then you go to the location and your goal will be to find that hiding spot and then open it up and sign the log inside and oftentimes some, you know, some people will leave some stuff for you to take if you leave something of equal, equal of greater value or will even have these so-called travel bugs which are meant to go from geocache to geocache and then you can see exactly what its destination is so it's a fun little game it's kinda like the Easter, Easter egg hunt without um, the Easter or the eggs and so now we have people that are that are going online to geocaching.com to get these coordinates and they go to a specific location. So how do you leverage that for people to do searches? Well, one of the uh, really fun things about geocaching is there's a discipline called multicaching. So you will have multiple containers with with these treasures, so to speak, and only the location of one is being revealed to you and in order to find the location of the next one you have to solve the first one you have to go to the container and then in there there will be a clue as to how you can find the next one so you know, now start now the plan starts to formula it's like oh, okay that means that I can go ahead and if I were to rank my clients website who is perhaps a dentist I can tell my client say okay what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a little page on your website and it's going to have a nice little rhyme, like a nursery rhyme that we're going to come up with, and uh, uh, it's going to be a clue for where the no next location of the geocache is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
hide one cache, and in the cache I'm going to have the instructions for how to find this clue. Oh, simply look for Bob's Bob's Dental, and uh, on the bottom right corner uh, of the of the home page, you will see a little geocaching icon. Click on that to find your next clue. And so they whip up their phone when they're at the location of geocache, and they search for Bob's Dental, and they find the website because that's the name of the the website. They find the website, they click on the thing, and then they see a little nursery rhyme. So it's like, oh, okay, so I gotta go 20 steps north, and then I gotta scratch my butt and spit in all four directions and it'll miraculously show up in front of me. Bottom line is they're participating and you're gamifying the whole experience. You're, you're making the navigational search part of a game and they're not even aware of what they're doing, that they're doing a massive favor, but they're just completing the game. And so at that point, uh, the whole goal is how do you make your cache super interesting so that more, more cachers will go out there and hunt for this. And by the way, there are literally millions of us around the world that are doing this sort of stuff. I mean, geocaching is huge. The only, for those of you guys that are listening to this and have never heard of geocaching, the only reason why I haven't, because we try very hard to be very stealthy when we go geocaching, and we don't tend to talk about it very often. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a big, big, huge thing. Just go to geocaching.com and navigate on a map to your area and see how many caches there are around where you live and you'll be blown away as to how much of this stuff is happening. But you can position people at specific geographical locations and cause them to do these searches. Now, as I said, you're not going to get a lot of searches this way. It's definitely not something that uh, is going to make or break your website. But if you're doing that in conjunction with a global strategy, something that is content-driven, you're going to have some really nice, good, solid um, location generated searches to so somebody that's at a specific location. Kaboom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I was speechless before, I am... Yeah, like I said, this is like Christmas morning right now. Uh, and it's fun. That's the yeah. best part about it. Is, I mean, this is something that... It's not something that you say, okay, I'm going to now have to do this as part of my business or something like that. No, this is something you do on the weekend with the kids anyways, right? Because it's fun. It's a fun thing to do. Yeah. So, so long story short, just to kind of put in perspective, the geocaching um, that ultimately gets people to search for things. And like you said, you use the example of the dentist. The dentist has a website, or if it's the real estate agent, the real estate agent has the website. Trying to get people that are looking to buy or sell a house to go to the realtor's website. If you make that page that has that gaming little component on there. Ultimately, you're just you're just driving traffic to the website, and people don't even really realize they're doing it just because they're playing exactly. this game. That's exactly it. When you look at the analytics of any website that um, that is worth anything on the internet, the top search will well the top search will always be um, not known or it's basically a, um, obscured from 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 view. But the one immediately underneath should be something to do with the brand or the actual URL of the website. They're called navigational searches. The reason why they're called that is because it's an indication of somebody who is searching on the internet to navigate to that specific website. Not just any website out there, um, but that specific website. So as long as it's a navigation, so in case of, since we're talking about uh, geocaching and GPS, if I type in Garmin, contact us, I'm looking for a contact us page on Garmin.com website, most likely. You know, if I go to uh, Wall, if I type in Wall Street Journal, I'm probably looking to go to Wall Street Journal. Now, with Wall Street Journal, you could end up also having w, wsj.com as the navigational search, and they all count towards, hey, people are looking for this website. Uh, I'm going to now allow this website to rank better because it's already popular. So, by doing these uh, geocaching uh, adventures, so to speak. You just got to make sure that whatever the clue is inside doesn't tell them go to this address because that would defeat the purpose. You tell them search for Bob's Dental. So you use the name of the brand if that happens to be the, uh, the, the URL of the website so much better but you just basically tell them the brand so that they search for it and guess what? Google is smart enough for, for, for you to have that website ranking number one when you're searching for that specific term anyway because the Google's algorithm is not 
it's not as much of a secret as people will think. Actually, you can download the, the patent for how Panda, the current algorithm, operates. And in there, they say, they specifically say that um, the number one spot on Google is reserved for navigational queries only. And only when there's no navigational results for that specific query uh, will it show other stuff in the spot number one. But number one is always reserved for navigational queries. And so if you have a website and you do a navigational search and it doesn't bring up your website, you have other problems. It's, it's not going to be an easy task for you to just go ahead and send some searches that way. You're going to have to do a little bit of branding. And this is where, again, podcasting, blogging, that sort of stuff comes into play. Awesome. Uh, I just want to kind of synthesize this in, these incredible strategies and tips that you're providing here. Um, uh, I guess the biggest challenge with all of this, Ivan, is um, the days of a free lunch and just the, the instant gratification are over. Where it just it just takes time to establish no, the brand. Not. No, they're not. Again, you can get no? you can you can eat your cake and and have it too the other way around, right? Okay. Um. So. What I would do if I if I really need to get some traffic ASAP, like if I don't get any traffic in the next two weeks, I'm I'm bust, right? What I would do is I would again pick an authority website. So let's say YouTube, right? YouTube is an authority website. You can send links to YouTube all day long, and you're not going to harm it any. It gets links anyways all day long. So links which are lifeblood of of ranking rankings are probably going to harm a new site, but on YouTube not so much. So you create a YouTube channel, and then you go, okay, let's go ahead and craft some killer content or interview some people. If I don't have time to craft content, I'm going to write 10 different questions that my audience would probably want to have an answer to, and I would hit up a bunch of people today and say, hey, I want to do a hangout with you, kind of like what we're doing right now. Now, what you want to do is you want to pick out the people that are searched for online. And you can find that out easily by going to Google and typing their name. And if the auto auto suggest shows up at the very top for their name, and their property, their Facebook page, or their personal website shows up number one, it is probably somebody that you might want to go after. So what you then do is uh, do an interview, do a hangout with them, post it on YouTube. If you're doing hangouts, it's automatically gonna gonna show up out there. Make sure to use that person's name in the actual name of the Hangout, and there's additional things that you can do to optimize that, such as, uh, for example, provide transcription uh, file of, of that thing, and then use that name in the description as well. Bottom line is, when you do that, uh, the moment it's live, send a bunch of links to that specific property, and make sure that each and every page that's linking to that, someplace within the page, uses the same name of the same person. It, it, you don't want to necessarily put it in the link itself, but just all the other pages that are pointing to that Hangout, uh, use the name of that person. Guilty by association, Google's going to rank that property very quickly, and if you're doing a good job of interviewing and funneling people to where else they need to go, hey, subscribe to my site uh, to get more information. The after show is out there. If you want to find out the XYZ, we have downloadables out there, yada, yada, yada. Bottom line is you're funneling people to your site, you have now gotten your traffic and as and is, is, is little as seven to ten days. So it doesn't have to be that difficult. You're not going to be getting people to your own website directly. You can't. It's just not going to happen with a new website. But you can get people to your website, which is the end goal, getting people to the website. And so um, by building that, you get traffic, and some of those things are going to end up in conversions. Not only that, uh, you're going to impress a lot of people that really matter, and they're going to possibly want to do JVs with you, which is a perfect thing to to follow up with them and say, hey, here's a video that we posted. Here's the URL if you want to go ahead and share it with those folks. And by the way, um, if there's anything else that I can help you with your with your business, if you want to go ahead and, um, you know, if I can market that to my list, you may not have a list at that point, but you have traffic. You're starting to have traffic coming to your site and membership. You know, just let me know. And if you have a list, I mean, it only takes like less than 1,000 people on your list for you to have enough leverage to say, let's do some sort of a JV. I'll go ahead and market uh, uh, your products to my list, and you can do the same thing for me. Is that an invitation, Ivan? Uh, we could do, definitely do something like that. Yes. All uh, right. All right. Uh, beautiful. 
with all of that that you just mentioned, what what are what are some of the biggest uh, mistakes that you're seeing people that try to get up and running and do this? What are you what are you seeing some some common pitfalls with all of this, or or mistakes that that people make when they try to execute these uh, amazing strategies? Um, the mindset is the biggest thing. Um, understanding, really thinking about. Uh, let me back that up. Understanding what real means. We always say when you're doing stuff in, in um, online, when you're trying to manipulate Google, you got to make sure that whatever it is you're doing appear, appears real to Google, not like you're manipulating something. And the biggest the biggest problem is understanding what real means. What what does it mean to be real? And there is not a single, unfortunately, formula to to, to define that. Because it's always changing, we always kind of have to step, you know, stay one step ahead of uh, the game. If you really are looking into getting into the SEO, I would suggest that you get into it for the purpose of ranking things that are super easy to begin with, just because it's going to make your life a lot easier, like people's names or the names of intermediate-sized brands on the internet that are talking to your audience. Um, the big pitfall would be to go ahead and go to Google Keyword Tool and say, wow, this keyword is getting 10,000 searches a, a, a day or a month or whatever, and then try to go after that keyword. That's difficult, and it's probably not going to convert anyways because for you to produce good conversions, you have to have a funnel that matches the keyword, and that takes some finessing and takes, takes some time to kind of understand that. So uh, really, by focusing on the organic way to grow your business, you're going to stay away from Google's radar for a very long time. You don't even have to worry about backlinks half the time because if you're creating good quality content, people will link to you. People that you interview are going to want to link to you. They're going to talk about it on their blogs and whatnot. It's easier to create links like that. And guess what? You're talking to people in the authority niches. They are probably open. Some of them are going to have established websites, and uh, they're going to be topical websites. They're going to be linking to your website. What more could you want? What to avoid? Yeah pretty much anything to do with black hat early on and anything that just seems like it's so logical things that if it sounds here's a here's a litmus test if it sounds logical and easy to do it probably ain't you probably are not to be doing it hmm. you know it's funny like uh, I so wanted to interject with with a little joke uh, about a half an hour ago but but you were on a roll like giving all this great stuff I didn't want to stop you <laughs> It was at the point when you were talking about how uh, you know uh, I don't want to I don't want to sp speak about something because Google might be watching or on a hangout or whatever. I was just envisioning uh, two guys sitting in a white van outside of my apartment, <laughs> you know, like the uh, the Google FBI or whatever. But uh, but but now they know about me and I'm in trouble. They're gonna they're gonna approach me in my driveway tomorrow morning. Two guys. Yeah, there's, there's the little white van that says Bob's Plumbing, and the pizza delivery guy keeps on delivering pizza to it. Something's wrong with that picture. They must have helicopters over your house with the big spotlights, and they kind of. I kind of live out in the boonies, so for them it's pretty hard to sneak up on me. Yeah, good stuff. Um, all right, so that that was phenomenal uh, strategies and information to say the least. I'd say extremely valuable. The whole. The whole thought process that you just provided to us, we're kind of just clearing the air and just saying, okay, um, these are the best ways to, to move um, to try to, you know, like you said, establish a brand and, and driving traffic and credibility and authority. And uh, it, it was great because I, I know that much of this um, generating leads in business, it can be it can be quite daunting and confusing and there's there's so much information out there and everyone's got to, everybody you know has this different um, way to do things and uh, but, but but clearly I knew that we were in for a treat here that you were gonna set it straight today in this interview this is great so so Ivan um, what would be a realistic goal for somebody uh, I know this may or may not be kind of a straightforward answer it's a bit of a loaded question I apologize but That's as, right. soon as, someone, as soon as someone is done listening to this and watching this video, I think that – did you say something, Well, that one can see improved rankings within uh, a week or two or something like that? How would someone set a goal for themselves to so say, okay, uh, I am a nobody. I'm a real estate agent. I have a website. You know, let's just say, okay, I I do everything that you you recommend, set up the funnel with the lead magnet, get a podcast going, do a press release. 
um, you know, start to reach out to uh, other experts that are in the the arena. Let's just say they even do the little geocaching game that, that you described. Um, how can someone structure this and make it in a goal-oriented uh, manner so it would be okay? Uh, step one, I'll do this, you know, and by two weeks, I hope to achieve X, Y, like, and Z. Do you, do you know mean, what I mean? What What will be the steps to take? You know, day one, day two, or you know, what's yeah, the yeah, what's yeah, the recipe yeah, for how for how you structure it? Like, yeah. How do you come up with your own recipe, or right? So if you wanted to say, okay, um, here's your one, two, three action item, and then um, just something because ma many real estate agents they're very goal oriented. You know, they're saying, well. Um, I don't know if you can really describe it in the context of um, my website's not even ranked right now. Right now, it's nowhere on any first, second, or third page of Google. My goal is in six months to be on the first page of Google, even if it's at the bottom. And then within one year, I want to be in the top three. And then in three years, I want that number one ranking on Google. That's my goal. Um, it, does it work that way or no? Can you can you set goals for this type of yeah. stuff? You can. Uh, that's kind of like really long term. You can probably do things a lot faster than that too. Yeah. Um, that's oh, the good better. news. Um, I like to mind map a lot of stuff. So I use a software called Bubble. It's actually a website called Bubble. B-U-B-B-L dot U-S. So it's kind of a wonky spelling of Bubble. And uh, I will I will basically uh, you know to, uh, always start with you know where I'm currently at and where I want to be. Those are just like and you can use any mind mapping software for this sort of stuff, but essentially I'll describe what my current uh, situation is and what my goal is. And I'll try to come up with as few possible the intermediary steps that I can fit in there and then elaborate on those. It's kind of hard to explain this without showing you what that lo really looks like, but if you can draw like little bubbles and then connect the dots using lines from A to B to C, uh, you're going to find that as you're building this stuff, you're going to go I typically start, you know, I put the where I'm at, and where I'm, where I'm gonna be at, and I always look at the last bubble and go, okay, so what is the situation that would get somebody, uh, like, what's what's the most logical step just prior to that? What's the situation that commonly gets people to go from this spot to that spot? Because they're not gonna go from where I'm at currently. They have to move through through a certain number of steps, and I have to go through those steps myself. And that will basically, just asking myself that specific question, will tell me exactly what needs to go in there. So if my goal is to sell 20 properties, that means that I have to speak to, um, I don't even know how many people that, that would be in the real estate industry, whatever whatever the closing rate is and that sort of stuff. So I would look at those, those, those uh, statistics and I would say, well, if I have to sell 20 homes this month, um, is that even possible? Sure I would say, people, you, yeah, you'd have to have so much traffic, hundreds, maybe even the low thousands of just. Okay, yeah, let's say let's say that you want to sell, numbers. Let's say that you have to sell one property a month. All right, so yep. that's that seems fairly realistic. So if I'm going to sell one property every single month, how many no's do I have to eat before I get a yes? What is an average in this industry? And you can find that out even if if you're new to this industry. You don't know where you're starting. You can find that out by interviewing people like what we're doing right now. This is why I love stuff like this. Um, and then just ask and find out. It's like, okay, so I got to talk to, say, I don't know, 50 people in order to make that happen. I need to basically show home 50, you know, do 50 shows before I actually uh, uh, do one close. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of, so now I have this bubble out here. I know what my goal was. And I have, you know, talk to 50 people or show 50 homes. How do I show 50 homes? Well, I'm going to have to send out how many invites uh, or how many people do I have to connect with on a regular basis in order for them to go ahead and show interest. So how do I go ahead and funnel people to even ask me to show them 50 homes? What does that mean? Again, you can find that out by interviewing an expert. So it's a perfect question for an interview in that specific scenario. And they're going to tell you, okay, well, you, what you probably want to do in this specific scenario is position yourself so that you're showing up at these locations when people do searches or when they're at these events. This is where there's a lot of that sort of stuff happening. It's like, okay, so the previous bubble means that I got to show up at these five different locations. I got to go to chamber meetings, whatever that may be, right? But now you have a cluster of things that you have to do. And now you basically branch out and say, okay, how am I going to schedule this in a very time-efficient way? Right, because oftentimes when we look at a huge 
a task like that, so I gotta I gotta eat all that. It seems overwhelming, and we just don't do stuff. But when you when you end up with a big cluster of items that you have to do, what you need to really have to ask yourself is how can I do this that is time efficient? It's not no longer a question of what am, which one of these I'm going to do. It's the question of how I'm going to do these time efficiently. And asking yourself these questions inevitably never really produces answers because as long as you're asking questions, uh, you are forcing your brain to start brainstorming different ways that will get you there in the first place. As opposed to what most people will do is they will take a look at the cluster of tasks and say, that's impossible. The question never comes up and so there is no solution. You just assume that it's impossible and you don't do anything. So strategizing is the most important part of the entire process. And getting back to your strategy and tweaking it when you find out that something's not working. I'm having problems with this stuff. Why? What could be the problem? Oftentimes when we're creating online sales funnels, uh, we, we go from a lead, man, lead magnet to some sort of a very cheap offer so they buy something, they spend money with me uh, to begin with so that I can then go ahead and convert them into a core offer buyer and then just step them up through the entire process. Uh, but if you look at your funnel and you go, okay, I got a lot of people opting in and I got a decent number of people that are buying the cheap offer, offer is probably good, but nobody's buying the core offer. Why? All right. Is it too expensive? Is there not enough value? Oftentimes, it's, there's not enough value. Is there a disconnect between what they bought previously and this? Am I talking to you, even talking to the right market? Those are all the kind of questions that pop to your mind. And the moment you ask yourselves those, you go, "Oh, am I talking to the right?" Yeah, I'm. You know, it, kids are downloading this thing, and I'm marketing to people that are, you know, uh, buying cars. Kids are not going to be buying expensive cars. I'm talking to the wrong market. You, the answers immediately start to float up and surface when you start asking intelligent questions. That's the process for how do you how do you organize your time. I, I use that same process for just about everything I do when I have to organize my stuff.